Hi, this is Natalie Hoffman of FlyingFreeNow.com, and you're listening to the Flying Free Podcast, a support resource for women of faith looking for hope and healing from hidden emotional and spiritual abuse. Welcome to episode 43 of the Flying Free Podcast. Today, it's just me, Natalie Hoffman. We had originally planned a podcast recording for this morning with some other advocates on the subject of reconciliation, and through a variety of different uh, circumstances, it ended up falling through. So I decided to record the podcast anyway, and and I would just dialogue with you about it. Um, This particular podcast is in response to some of the, the blog articles that I've written recently And I'll give you a little bit of background information. A couple of years ago, I listened to a sermon in a local church that I'd been attending for a couple of years. And that sermon was when if you it wasn't a bad sermon, but if you listen to it through the lens of an abuse survivor, it was some somewhat shaming. And it would be the kind of sermon that would cause someone living in an abusive environment to feel like they needed to stay there. And there was no other options for them. And that if they tried to get out, that they would be not being obedient to God or would be a bad Christian or whatever. So it's, it's basically the kind of sermons that I grew up hearing and that I um, heard a lot in my adult life that kept me stuck in my own abusive relationship. And so I, I thought, you know, I am going to, I, I started taking copious notes as I listened to the sermon because I realized, I really felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, Natalie, this is so important. You need to be writing this stuff down. So I started writing things down and I went home and I wrote a blog article basically spelling out the things that I was seeing. Because I understand that if you're not an abuse victim, you may not under, you may not be able to see or hear the kinds of things that an abuse survivor would see and hear in a sermon like that. And I thought it would be very enlightening for abuse survivors to be able to discern and pick apart things like that. But also, it would be enlightening for people who have not experienced abuse themselves to be able to get the perspective of an abuse survivor. And so in my mind, I was thinking, oh, this will be so great. People can learn. They can get, um, they can be better advocates. They can be better helpers. And I was thinking, you know, this pastor and his team, I'm sure they're different from the pastor (laughs) and the team that excommunicated me. I'm sure these guys are going to be, you know, so much more open to, to feedback. And this is me being the ever ever positive, ever hopeful, you know, person that I am. And so I sent a, I actually recorded myself reading the blog article so that this team, this, uh, the leadership team at this particular church would be able to meet me and, you know, meet me in a recording and, um, that I would be a real person to them and not just someone hiding behind my words. Well, I did that and, I should have known better, but the response I got was not good. And actually, nobody on that leadership team responded to me, but the pastor, Wes Feltner, who's been in the news lately, did respond to me via email. And I I put all of this in a recent blog article, so you can check it out on my website, flyingfreenow.com. But um, he responded, and one of the interesting things that he said, he really demanded, was that I reconcile with him. And that was really, I thought that was really intriguing. And that's what I want to talk about today is what reconciliation actually is. So he wanted me to be reconciled to him before he would address the concerns that I laid out in my email and in my blog post. And by the way, in that original blog post, I did not say who he was. I didn't say what church it was. I just talked about it in general, like a a general Baptist church, because these are the kinds of, it was very symbolic of the kinds of messages that you hear in Baptist churches or other conservative types of churches all across the world. Okay, so yeah, I didn't really necessarily want to pick apart any particular church. It was the message that I was most concerned about. So, but this Wes Feltner felt that I needed to be reconciled to him. The only thing is reconciliation, the idea of reconciliation implies that a serious wrong has been done that's destroyed a relationship. And Wes Feltner didn't know me. 
and I didn't know him. I mean, I'd been going to his church, but I never even shook his hand. I'd never said hi to him in person. I knew nothing about him other than, you know, from watching his sermons. Um, I had picked up on a few things that I was very leery about, but I didn't know. I didn't have any facts, and they were just my thoughts or my, you know, my gut feelings. And so I don't, I usually dismiss those until I see some really hardcore evidence that someone is a problematic. But um, anyway, reconciliation implies that there is a basically a wall between two people that has in, that have been previously close or had a previous relationship of some kind, and that a wall has been put up now, and that wall needs to be taken down so that those two people can be reconciled with one another. So it has nothing to do with giving feedback, like for example, a person in the congregation giving feedback to their pastor has nothing to do with that. There's no reconciliation needed. When you give feedback to your pastor, it's a very straightforward process. You give them feedback and then they respond in the way that their character, uh, you know, they they respond out of the the character that is within them. Okay. So if they've got a, a character that is like Christ, they're going to respond out of that character. If, they're, if they have a character that is more of a wolf hiding behind sheep's clothing, they're going to respond out of that character. And that's actually what I want to talk about next. It is a dead giveaway that, a, that there's a wolf hiding in sheep's clothing when they respond to feedback by making demands or by um, becoming defensive and, and offended in such a way that they begin to attack you. Okay, and it's also when they want things to be covered up or hidden, that's also a dead giveaway. So here's the thing about wolves in sheep's clothing. They're in sheep's clothing. So they look like you, they talk like you, they act like you, like all the other sheep. And you can't, you cannot, you don't know that there's a wolf in there until you give them feedback. So that's why I always suggest to people who are out of their prior abusive relationship and they're getting to know new people, maybe new romantic interests, or even just new friendships, or maybe a new church. If you are wondering if the other person is safe, give them feedback about something. Disagree about something. Show up as yourself. If you are afraid to show up as who you are, being authentic, having your own perspective, your own ideas, your own opinions. If you're afraid to do that, or you sense that if you do that, that you're going to get attacked, that's not a safe person. It's not a healthy person. It's not a person, you know, if you're in the Christian world, it's not a Christ-like person. Okay. Jesus never got defensive. (laughs) He never responded by attacking people. Even those who attacked him and called him Uh, the son of the devil. He never, never attacked them back ever. So when, when someone's attacking you back, that means they're, they're doing that out of a sense of their own. There's something empty inside of them. There's something deficient inside of them and they are projecting their own deficiencies onto you. And they probably need to get into therapy or get some help for that. Usually wolves in sheep's clothing don't think they have a problem, so they're not going to go to therapy and get help. I recently heard uh, Dr. Romano, she was saying, you know, people always ask me, well, can, can an abuser change? She said, you know, I have had narcissists in my office. Rarely do narcissists come into an office for, a, you know, into a counseling office to get help. But she said that uh, when, when she has had them, they can make micro changes in that kind of laboratory environment. But when they go back out into their real world, it's, not, it's really difficult for them to actually change. And here's why. It's their personality. So she said it would be just as easy to get a person who, okay, right now, just close your eyes and imagine one of the nicest, kindest, um, sweetest, most empathic people that you have ever, ever met. I actually, ha- I have a daughter like this. She is absolutely phenomenal. She's like an angel. And 
It's her personality. She's been like this her whole life. Nothing shakes her. She is just good as gold. I've never, I mean, I've never had to scold this child or anything. She's just amazing. Now try to take a person like that and put them in an office, in a counseling office, and change them or turn them into a malicious, malevolent person who wants to hurt other people, who wants to trick other people, who lies, who cheats, who does things behind other people's backs, who doesn't let other people show up as they are, who doesn't have empathy. Could you even do that? Dr. Romano points out that no, you can't do that because it's personality. People are either wired one way or they're wired another. Now, whether they get that way through nature or nurture nurture is irrelevant to the point of what I'm trying to say. It's that that's who they are and they're going to operate out of the character of who they are. So um, back to the back to the whole wolves in sheep's clothing. Um, when someone takes off their mask, we need to learn, we need to believe them. Because with people like this is they'll, they'll take off the mask and they'll expose themselves when they get feedback from you and they will put the mask right back on again and be really, really charming and really nice, especially to other people who didn't see them take it off. And it doesn't matter how many times you try to point out, but hey, wait a minute, I saw this, I saw this, and this is what they did they will, other people are going to have a really hard time believing you because all they see is the sheep mask and they hear the sheep talk and they see the sheep walk and all of that. And so it's really hard for the other people then to to believe that there's actually a wolf in there. Um, But anyway, it ends up, wolves end up exposing themselves enough eventually and the problem is that they, they can't help but be themselves. So there are people in their lives who know who they really are. I know that there's a lot of people in Wes Feltner's personal life who know exactly who he is, including, and I would be willing to bet that there are elders, that there are other people who work in that church, who have had per- close personal contact with him, who know what he's really like out of his character. And they're careful around him. And they've also probably, I'm guessing, discounted their own gut feelings and um, and whatever. So anyway, I know a person who worked as an intern at that church in the Sound. And this person told me that what they saw behind the scenes of Wes Feltner's character was not good. And this person no longer goes to that church either. So, And this was a very young person a young person who had enough discernment to see what was what. But unfortunately, it seems like Christians just have a really hard time grasping this. Um, So anyway, let's get back to the idea of reconciliation. So what happens when a person wrongs another person and destroys that relationship? Now, I'm not talking about, you know, in normal relationships, you can say something out of line because you're of the heat of the moment or, you know, you've had no sleep or whatever, whatever the case may be. We all do that, right? That's just normal human behavior. And then we realize later on that, oh, that probably hurt the other person's feelings because that other person is important to us, right? They're a person. We see them. We see them as a human being with a perspective that's different from us, feelings, thoughts, emotions that are different from ours, opinions that are different from ours, and we're okay with that. And we don't want to hurt them because we love them. So when they, when we see that we have wounded another person, we say, hey, I am so sorry. Will you please forgive me for, and then we say specifically what we did. When I snapped at you about that, that was the wrong way of, of bringing up a, a, the, the situation or, or whatever the case may be, Okay. That is how we, you know, are immediately reconciled to the other person. The other person says, oh, sure, no problem. I get it. You know, and and we move on. The problem is that in relationships that are severely destroyed is that one person is hurting the other person because they are not seeing the other person as a human being. They're seeing the other person as an object. They don't believe the other person has the right to their own feelings, their own opinions, their own beliefs, their own perspective. 
Is this content resonating with you? I've written a book for women of faith and destructive relationships called Is It Me? Making Sense of Your Confusing Marriage, a Christian Woman's Guide to Hidden Emotional and Spiritual Abuse. You can actually read reviews and find out more about my book on Amazon.com. It comes in paperback, Kindle, and Audible formats. I've also got a website specifically focused on helping women of faith find hope and healing. It's called flyingfreenow.com. I'll even give you the first three chapters of my book free if you want to hop on my mailing list at the top of my website. Those three chapters are going to help you figure out if your relationship is normal or destructive. Now, let's get back to our episode. Um, narcissistic type of people. I'm not talking about people who are diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. I'm just talking about people with narcissistic tendencies or narcissistic behaviors. Those kinds of people don't see other people as people that are worthy of respect and honor, just like they are. And that's a problem. And you can't have healthy relationships unless you have mutual respect, mutual love, Mutual vulnerability, mutual responsibility, mutual submission, and there's one more and I can't think of it off the top of my head, but I talk about these in my book. So what what happens with reconciliation, what's required is that the person who did the damage needs to acknowledge the damage that they did. That means specifically state what they did that was hurtful. The second thing they need to do is acknowledge that your perspective and your humanity is worth listening to and worth caring about. Then they need to acknowledge, I think I already said, acknowledge their specific behavior. It's not okay to just say, well, I'm sorry that you thought that I did that. That is not acknowledging your behavior. Or, well, I'm sorry. I know I can be kind of, you know, I know I can be cranky sometimes. No, that's not acknowledging specific behavior. You acknowledge it by saying specifically what you did. Redescribe what happened. Show the other person that you know what it was that hurt their heart. And then you make restitution. So the person who's done the damage needs to make a restitution. That means if they have gone around speaking poorly about you, saying things that are not true or that they have no evidence for, they need to make restitution by going back to the people that they have spoken poorly to you about behind your back, and they need to say, I was wrong. I wasn't really understanding or respecting the fact that this person had a different perspective from me and that this person has a right to have a different perspective from me. And I am sorry that I try to turn you against that other person because I want both you and me to respect the perspectives and the humanity of other people. That's what makes the world go round. That's what Jesus Christ modeled for us So if we want to be like Jesus, we're going to have to, we're going to need to also follow in his footsteps in this way. So making restitution, repairing the damage that's been done to a reputation. It means, it means that if you have, so, so when you, when you ruin someone's reputation, you've stolen something from them. You've stolen their reputation from them when you have, and by the way, though, because I know I can just hear it. Some people are saying, well, you've stolen Wes's reputation from him. Or those women who have come out from his past have stolen Wes's reputation from him. No, 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 no. It's not the same thing. See, if you do a naughty, naughty thing, then and, and someone tells about it, that's not that person didn't destroy your reputation. You did. Your reputation is what you do. Okay? It's what you do do. So if you do naughty things and someone points it out, you have just destroyed your reputation. And it wasn't destroyed when the person pointed it out. You destroyed it when you did the naughty thing. All right. So if you choose to go screw around with lots of women at the same time, 
you've just ruined your own reputation. And that's sad, but you got to make that choice. It was your choice to make and you made it. And now you're responsible for it. Whether you want to be responsible for it or not is irrelevant. Whether you take responsibility for it or not is completely irrelevant. You're still responsible for it before God and before the people whose lives you destroyed by stealing their innocence from them or whatever it is that you did. Okay, so, and then the last thing is that a person who is wants truly wants to be reconciled with you, they will give you all the time and the space that you need to heal. And that includes letting you go if you choose to do that. Okay, so they would say, you know, I did this hurtful thing to you. And I, while I would love to be reconciled with you and have a relationship with you again, I understand how that may not be possible. And you are free because I respect you and I respect what you need. You are free to make your own choice about whether or not you want to have a relationship with me. And, uh, <clears throat> and I respect whatever choice you make. See, this all goes back to boundaries. When we have healthy boundaries, we respect ourselves and we respect other people. We respect our own choices and we respect the choices of others. So we can respect that, for example, Wes made a choice when he was in his early 20s to have multiple relationships with women who were in his youth group while he was dating a woman who's now his wife. And we have to respect that that was his choice to make. He gets to do that. It's his life. But everyone that he has harmed also has choices to make, and they get to make their choices about what they're going to do about it. They get to decide if they're going to come out and say, hey, he did this to me, and it was wrong, and he has gotten away with it. Nobody's held him accountable. He's gone on and become, you know, thinks he can get any job anywhere he wants in a, a, a spiritual leadership position in spite of the fact that he has never, ever repented of his sin. And by the way, repentance is not, I'm sorry, and why aren't you forgiving me? That is not repentance. I just can't even wrap my brain around how some people think that that is repentance. Repentance is what I described earlier, the acknowledging the other person, the respecting them, the compassion for them, the empathy for the pain that you caused them, the the making restitution, and then the stepping down and saying, I should not be in these positions of spiritual leadership over other people, but I can still work another job. In fact, there are millions of other jobs that don't require spiritual leadership over other people, and I can work one of those jobs and, in fact, love others in any of those jobs just like Christ loved me. I can still live a fulfilling, Christ-like life after I've abused someone, but what I cannot do is think that I can be in a spiritual leadership position over other people. That is a choice that I made when I chose to screw around with other people's lives. Okay, I think I think that's really all I wanted to say. There is more that we could talk about as far as reconciliation, but um, I, I wanted to just talk about that in relation to the whole Wes Feltner situation. If you want to read more about what I have to say you can visit my website at flyingfreenow.com and just look up, if you look in the search bar under Wes Feltner, W-E-S-F-E-L-T-N-E-R, you can find my articles about him. And that's it for now. Until next time, fly free. <laughs>